excuse me. Gosh. Where are my manners? Want some? You see, I have a kind of a bagel and a half, or maybe a bagel and a quarter. I got some uh, Sabra, <laughs> hummus, and da 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 imperial margarine. Because it's fit for a king. And it kind of brings me to the whole idea of what, you know, wanted to talk about and to look at, you know, from the Word of God and from our understanding of the Scriptures according to what God has done in our life. You see, everyone has doctrines. I mean, everyone. You know, it's kind of foolish for a person to tell me, you know, and they, they often do, you know, well, I don't have religion. You know, yeah, you do. No, I don't. I don't have religion. And, you know, they go very adamant about it into their little spiel or a little shtick trying to explain how you know they have relationship oh you know oh, you know they just sit back on a cloud in nirvana you know and they don't move around and do anything because that's the only way you could not have religion if you have relationship with God you'd have to be floating on a cloud in the presence of God not moving because as soon as you move or breathe or have your being you have religion religion is that expression of relationship of, with God. Religion and perfect religion is this that Paul said or James said was to you know take care of widows and orphans and those kind of things but God gave religion to man that was to have man to approach God in some way shape form or fashion and if you have a relationship with God you have a religion that's just the way it is. Now people like to say and define what kind of religion they have. They like to say, I don't have that kind of rules and regulations of that particular brand of religion. But they still have religion. So don't get caught up into the games people play by the words that they use or the things that they say. Because religion isn't man's way of getting there someday and Christianity is not Christ and you and me. You know, it's my own little poem, but you know, it's what I used to say when I was very much doing the same thing that most people are doing today. Only I was doing it 35 years ago. Because 35 years ago we were talking about the formal religion expression or the formal religious expression of the denominationalism that was existent at the time. Nowadays people are trying to say, well, they don't have religion because they don't want to do something that's involved in doctrines or dogmas. They don't want to express themselves in a certain way. And so they make it out to be as though they have something better than religion. No, they don't. If they got a relationship, they got religion. Because you can have a relationship with God and if you do, you have some type of religion. But if you have a religion without a relationship with God, then it's dead. It's works. It's just not accomplishing anything. It's just a dead religion. So it's a type of religion that you have that's the important thing. It's also true with doctrines. Everybody's got them, whether you know it or not. You know, do you read your Bible? That's a doctrine, you know, believe it or not. The fact that you think, act, believe, or conceive of the concept that you need to or should or in some way read your Bible in order to hear God speak, understand the word, or in some way deal with the reality of God himself, that is a doctrine. It's a type of part of a expression of who you are and how you deal with the reality of knowledge and acquiring knowledge of God. And doctrines are those parts of Christian expression that deal with the segments or the parts of your relationship with God in a religious way. And so, doctrines aren't bad. They aren't good. They can be good or bad. They're neutral. They are something that just defines what, who, and how you are. And so, sometimes doctrines get kind of confusing. And that's why we started Video Doctrines, because there's a lot of things that people say, well, you know, the doctrine of gospel of grace, or the doctrine of, you know, the substitutionary propitiation of God, you know, and the sanctification, or the, you know, whatever doctrines there are in theology. But you see, there's also doctrines that aren't in theology, that are involved in life itself, in you and I, and our relationship with God, that 
somebody didn't, with a THD didn't just sit down and decide that, well, there's only 36 doctrines and that's it. No, <laughs> there's a whole lot more than that. And that's why we did video theology, or video, yeah, really, video theology ought to be a really good one <laughs> whenever I get around to that one because, you know, I, I exercise what's called, a, I think it's integral, oh well, integral? No, it's called IS, but anyways, the theology of it is very interesting, you know, someday I'll get into that maybe if I do a video about it, but anyways, the point being is that in video doctrines, we wanted to talk about how everyone has a doctrine and how some doctrines are really kind of like, you know, messed up and what we should do about them. And it's kind of like this bagel, you know. Now I got a piece of bread here, you know, and bread is kind of like the bread of life, you know. I can put on this bread of life anything I want to, really. Hmm. Good for a king. I just so happen to like... Hmm. Imperial margarine. Not because... that I, uh... like margarine over butter because I need to watch my calories. And some of you out there just went... <gasps> and about had a heart attack. You see, the other thing about video, we're real. So we act the way we normally act. We don't lie to each other, we tell the truth. So what you see is what you get. And as bread, I like bagels. As butter, I like imperial margarine, not any other, but imperial margarine, because I've accumulated a flavor for it and I like it. Now, most of you out there can tell me why I shouldn't eat imperial margarine. Most of you out there will tell me I shouldn't be putting that much margarine on my bread, and maybe I shouldn't have white bagels. <laughs> I mean, most of you will have a good reason. And that's kind of like what doctrines are. There's a good reason why some people shouldn't, excuse me, shouldn't have bagels. You know, these. There's a good reason why some people shouldn't have certain doctrines. You know, like a Catholic probably shouldn't have the doctrine of grace, you know, I mean, because it's really going to continue, because he has more of a doctrine of submission and guilt, you know, and some of these other things that, you know, are ordained of the papacy, you know, because they want to be a part of this structured religious expression to God. Some doctrines might not be so good for them. And so, quite frankly, I like my doctrines, and you do too. And so you have your own doctrines. You have your own favorites. Some of you, probably, when you think bagel, you think hummus. <laughs> hummus, hummus, hummus. And so, Ooh, you go out and you buy hummus. You know, you go out and learn your doctrine. You know, kind of like with a lot of these uh, people that have gotten into kind of this messianic thing and all these other different types of let's be, you know, kosher or let's be, you know, health food oriented. Because really, pardon me, but a Christian that's into health food and giving up meat and doing all these veggie things is no different than, you know, the messianic person who's going out the legalist road. I mean, they just get a little too carried away for their own good. Because unless they can sit down and eat at the same table with a guy like me who can do both, you know, I can go kosher if I want to, and I have, or I could go, I mean, kosher like in with the broom, you know, although I may have to fast first and get cleaned up, but anyways. But the point is, is that 
I can go anywhere and do anything because I have that freedom in Jesus. You know, Jesus has allowed me to be a part of those different communities at different times. But there's some people that are like so adamant about it that I couldn't even dare take this knife, which has been in margarine, which would be milchig, and put it in flesh egg anywhere. Although I can't find any flesh egg, but I have some, you know, vegetarian. <laughs> That's what hummus is, by the way, in case you didn't know, and garlic too. You know, so I can mix these metaphors. But the point is, if this were me, there'd be a bunch of Jews there screaming their heart out, saying, Don't eat it! No, no, you can't mix meat with milk products! And they never would have a cheeseburger. I like cheeseburgers. Mmm, I like that garlic. So my doctor is really what I spread on the salvation I've been given by God. The bread of life has come down to the world. Jesus is the bread of life. If you have a basic knowledge of God's salvation, and in some way you will become saved, then what you do after that is really what you put on your life as you eat the Word of God, as you consume the bread of life, as you devour the Word, the Bible, as He's teaching you. And that's how you acquire doctrines and you learn what you like, what you don't like, what's good for you and what isn't good for you. That's why we use this metaphor Mm. Okay, I lied. The reason why we use this metaphor is because I'm hungry and it tastes good. But that's why we use this metaphor. Mm. <sighs> of eating because that's what the Word of God is. It's food for your soul. It feeds your spirit. It causes you to grow. The nutrients and the fact of what you learn or devour from the Word of God is your spread, so to speak, of something that was natural that's been converted into something to be added to the Word of God. And that is what a doctrine is. It's added to the Word of God to make it garlic crushed. Ooh. Dare I? Should I? Anybody watching? Oh. Doctrines are added to the Word of God in order to enjoy mm, <laughs> to enjoy the study of the Scriptures, but enjoy the fullness of what God has for you. Now, I'll admit, some people use doctrines for other purposes, to beat each other up, to stomp on each other, to tell each other what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and where to do it. Not interested. I'm more interested in sharing with you the facts. So, today's doctrine huh, is... Let me tell you what you got to do. You got to go to church. <laughs> Not... <laughs> you see, the interesting thing about doctrines is that I got a container here full of a lot of hummus, but it's got very little garlic right in the middle, mainly because most people can't handle that much garlic. Now me, I could eat all the garlic all day long, wouldn't even notice, but the point is, is that 
doctrines, especially like the one you got to go to church, are always based on a small part, very small part, usually, most doctrines, even sometimes an absolutely minuscule part, and sometimes no scripture at all, but always a very little part of the Bible. Most doctrines have a lot of what man said and very little of what God said. And so sometimes it doesn't take a whole lot of genius to figure out that the doctrine might not be as accurate as the people that want it to be. And that's kind of what church is like. Everybody wants you to go to church. I mean, everybody. Me too. Personally, I think you know, church is good for you. Now, I don't know what church, but some church somewhere is good for you. But if you don't go to church, you're not going to hell. That's pretty simple. You see, going to church is nowhere stated in the scripture. Nowhere. It doesn't say that thou shalt go to church. It doesn't say thou shalt not go to church. Matter of fact, there's only one real scripture that is ever used for the doctrine of going to church, and that is, forsake not the assembling together of the brethren. Well, quite frankly, them being a lot of Jews at the time, they were supposed to get together in Jerusalem pretty regularly, you know, God said so. But let's forget about that. Forsaking not the assembling together of the brethren was written to a church, about a church, so that they would be a church. Because if they didn't write it to a church, who were they writing it to? They weren't writing it to just average believers. It was written specifically to a church that had already assembled together, been together, and knew each other. It was the habit, or the tradition, of the Jew in those days to go to the synagogue on Saturday and to go to church on Sunday. <gasps> what? Yeah. You see, that's how the church was started. It wasn't started as a separation from Jewish culture. It wasn't started as a separation from Judaism. Matter of fact, it was really a part of the Jewish expression of God. Now, I'm not saying messianic, believe me. But I'm not saying Catholic either. What I am saying is, originally, those people in their culture at their time expressed their faith in sharing together at a time and a place of their choosing and moving together as a unity of the body of believers. So they expressed themselves by getting together on Sunday and began to have, you know, matzo balls. No, they began to have bagels. You know, and they got to some hummus and they said, let's have church. <laughs> and so they'd sit around, you know, and said, it was it synagogue that had just been kind of like a new movement that had come along because normally they'd meet at the temple but since the religious leaders of their time had rejected Jesus and his teachings and Jesus never told them to forsake the leadership they got together on Sunday they said well we're still going to study you know yeah maybe we'll go read Torah but you know we'll study on Sunday it was a pretty simple solution so you know those that wanted to could go to synagogue on Saturday and go to church on Sunday they had us all until dogma came and doctrine then it all exploded. Suddenly people were saying, Ah, you got to go on Saturday. Others were saying, No, you got to go on Sunday. 
What's the fellow supposed to do? Oy vey, God, what do we do with these people? Today, it's much like that. You got people that'll say, well, you got to go to church on Saturday. Usually the ones that are so pushing it really are messed up. You know, no offense to Seventh-day Adventists, but there's a lot of them that got some really squirrely ideas. They they managed to really mess up the Messianics, too. Of course, the Messianic people didn't need much help to mess themselves up. They got a little carried away on their dogmas and doctrines, so much so that they went, whoa! They have their ground, they have their face in the ground looking for the roots so much that they forgot to look for the branches, you know, and the fruit. So they were down in the ground and they're still scrounging around trying to figure out where the roots are. I don't know about you, but uh, I don't want to go in the roots. I'd rather be out on the branches bearing fruit. Just me. Maybe I'm wrong. But you see, that's kind of what happens when you... Uh, have doctrines. It's men and women getting together and deciding what they want to do and then telling everyone what they're going to do. And that's kind of what they did with church. They said, you got to go to church. You, you, you just got to go. So that way you could be like us. And to put it bluntly, if you want to be like them, you go there. And that's kind of what going to church is about. If you want to share in what there's there, if you want to share in what is there, you go there. If you don't want to be a part of what they're doing there, don't go there. You don't go there in order to change someone, and you don't go there in order to convince someone to not go there. Jesus said that about his disciples. He said, look, John the Baptist is baptizing disciples, you know, and they got disciples, and we've got our disciples, should we tell them to follow us? And Jesus said, no, leave them alone. Let John do what he's doing because no man can receive what he's got except to be given to him of the Father. So don't bug them. Let them go with their doctrine. And they did. They became Baptists. <laughs> don't tell the Baptists I said that. But Jesus, whenever there was a challenge of following men or following God, Jesus told Peter even, follow thou me. And that's where the difference between going to church as a doctrine and going to church as a choice comes in. When you're following Jesus, if you want to go to church, you go to church. If you don't want to go to church, you don't go to church. It's no big deal. It's not going to kill you. You won't drop dead. You won't lose your salvation. And in some ways, depending on what church you're going to, it might be a benefit. But God knew that you would not live according to doctrines. So he didn't send you his son in order to give you a new doctrine. He said, I will give you a new and living way. I will demonstrate to you how you should live your life. And that was to see the Father, to know the Father, and to follow the Father. To see what He's doing in heaven, to hear what He has to say to you, and to do what He tells you to. Now that's pretty clear. What you see is what you get kind of relationship. What you see, what you hear, what you're supposed to do. You don't do it, you're disobedient. Churches, whenever they have sat down to conform themselves and everybody to agree on the same thing because not everybody hears the same thing have always come up with doctrines in order to customize people's experiences of the word of God so that they would understand it better unfortunately denominations all through the years have tried the same thing and failed miserably at it <laughs> whenever you have a bunch of human beings that are trying to understand the scriptures, you're going to get a bunch of different opinions. Just like if you have two Jews, you'll have ten opinions. I know. I know. Mamala says, Yari says, Yari says, Rabbi so and so says. You can quote quite a few sources if you thought about it. But the point is, is this kind of doctrine that, you know, has come up of you have to go to church. 
has actually become really pushy lately. So much so that I needed to come out and make a statement about it that was pretty radical for these latter days that we live in. You see, we have people saying that you have to go to church and now you have to be a part of a mega church. No. You see, in my mind, if I have a choice between going to a mega church and going to the internet, pardon me, but I'm going to the internet. If I wanted to be on a bandwagon or go to a coliseum in order to have a church, I'd go to a football game and worship on the 50 yard line. Because you see, I don't get that out of that mega mass of appeal that most people feel. Me personally, I sit down usually with my wife. And I go to a new city and I'll say, Honey, here we go again. She knows what's coming. I'll say, You know, you've been with me long enough that I'll pray the Lord thy God, you know, to show me where he wants me to go. Because I should be accountable, responsible to somebody around me, you know, for what I'm doing because I'm a wacko. But, you know, I'll, I'll pray that of the Lord, you know, you know, just like most people have told me you know, I should, you know, so the different ministries I've been involved in. So I sit down, you know, I get into a new city and I say, Lord, show me the church where we go. So, he does. I go, okay. Now, Lord, you know my face. You know my will. You know my way. If you want me to stay at this church after visiting it, you show me. And every church that I've gone to, about 20 or 30 of them, unless the Lord sent me to it specifically and said, go there and stay there, at least 10 to 15 of them, every time I went, and most of them, a lot of them with my wife, the pastor wasn't there on the day I showed up. on a Sunday. Now, I don't think about it ahead of time. I just kind of go, you know, Lord, I kind of feel like I probably should try it again. You know, or, you know, you know, whatever goes on, you know. Sure enough, like right now today, as I make this video recording, so I'm being honest with you, I don't get to go to where I would probably say, let's go, because guess what? I laid out the fleece and I said, Lord, if you want me to be here, you want me to stay here, just make the pastor be there. And they aren't there. Now, you might not have that problem. Maybe you don't talk to God direct. Maybe you don't get answers direct. Maybe you don't have a ministry which is probably why I don't get the chance to really get involved in some of these churches I'd love to go to because, quite frankly, I already have a ministry going, you know, and the church is preparing you for the ministry and equipping you and giving you all the tools that you need in order to get out there and go do something with your faith. And so, maybe, you know, that might be why. I don't know. I don't ask God why. I just go, well, okay, praise the Lord. You know, I kind of go back to doing what I'm doing. You know, and I study, and I every day am in the Word of God, and every day share the Word of God, and every day you know teach the Word of God, and every day pretty much you know have some type of personal relationship with God that I'm walking in the Spirit with Him constantly, always being changed and manipulated or maneuvered by God into the conformity of His image, so that He would make me into the person He wants me to be. But uh. Contortionist. But the point being is that I know, based upon my experience, that though the doctrine is false of going to church, I do tell people and teach them to go to church because that's where I had some of my richest experiences and some of my worst. Some of my best 
best growing experiences were when I was challenged by some of the churches that God put me in, you know, and said, stay there. And I went, yeah. You know, I had to deal with it. And sometimes it was, sometimes some of the places that, you know, you'd normally say, well, they should have been right on. And I'd go, yeah, right. <laughs> Excuse me. Sometimes, you know, whoo -hoo. You know, doesn't mean just because they have a name that they're the same as what the original was, you know. Ooh, we're not perfect. We're just forgiven. But having said that, that means that you yourself as a person have to examine these doctrines that you've been given. You have to look at the baseline of your experience with God and your relationship in a personal, intimate way to understand what doctrines are good for you, what you like, like in Plumas or Imperial Margarine. I mean, quite frankly, you could probably put fish on it, you know, which I like to put sardines on, you know, my bagels, you know. Or you could just use white bread, you know. Say what? Huh? You know. I mean, you could do that. You know, you can do almost anything you want to up to a point of salvation within respect of there being certain parameters that, yes, of course some doctrines are true and accurate according to the Bible. But that's not really where we go with that because we don't make it our faith statement about doctrines. Our faith statement is about our relationship with God and the doctrines that He makes alive in us that someone would say, well, that's the doctrine of And I'd go, well, yeah, but that's not how I call it. Maybe you do. Because God never called it the doctrine of salvation in the Bible. He said, if you want to be saved, follow not me. And so, there's a lot of why people shouldn't be using some of the things that they say because you're really pushing people away from knowing their faith and relationship with God in an intimate way. And why they don't go to church as much as they probably could if they just get away from the theological aspect of it and deal with the reality of the relationship of part of having a family unit that is what the church is meant to be. Because if you have a home, according to the book of Acts, if you have in your house right now, you and the Holy Spirit and God the Father and God the Son, and you yourself have a Bible, you have a church. That's it. Bottom line, that's the definition of church, period. Guess what? The assembly has four people in it. Literally. And so you could invite all the angels in heaven and come in and sit down and relax and have time with you and minister. But don't fool yourself. God is not mocked either. God is the one who directs your life. God is the one who determines what doctrines are real in your life. God is the one who chooses for you what you should do, where you should go, and how you should live. And if you don't live according to the will of God, then you are going to be living contrary to God, and God will be acting contrary to who you are and making you look like a fool if you're not going to church. So you see, the doctrine of going to church technically is false. Is it a good thing to go to church? Sure, no problem. It's not a real accurate doctrine, no, not at all. Matter of fact, it's not even one that's ever been stated in the scriptures. Nowhere will you find at any point in time that the Bible actually says, go to church. None at all. Nowhere. Jesus said, follow thou me. And nine times out of ten, there's a good reason why. Because God has a purpose for you and a plan. And if the wind bloweth whither will, you neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going. So too with everyone led by the Spirit of God. You don't know if that church will be there tomorrow or it'll be there today. So the point is, you are the church. That defeats the whole purpose of saying whether or not there's a doctrine of going to church or not. Because you are the church. You may be your own church, but you are a part of the members of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ, there is a part that God says you are a part of. It doesn't say that you have to go be a part of that body. It says you are a part of that body. And as such, you are a member in particular. So don't be too tweaked out or torqued out about the doctrine of going to church. Especially if you're sitting there in some kind of mega enterprise and you're going, you know, I see all the people and, you know, it's kind of fun sitting in the stadium, but, you know, I could be sitting at TV land, you know, doing the same thing as all these people are doing right now. Because they're all on their smartphones and, you know, texting. and They're all kind of doing their own thing in this crowd anyways. So, 
sure, it's nice to have a kumbaya moment, but I don't have to be here in order to know Jesus. I don't have to be in the congregation of the assembly of people in order to know God. I can know, grow, experience, develop, and learn as God leads me by the Spirit of God who says, you have no need that any man teach you, but the Spirit of God that dwells within you, he will lead you into all truth. I can, as God leads me, be the church if I'm willing to lay down my life and give it to God and let Him 